Before talking about the new birth, and before even talking about the God of mercy, there's something else that comes prior to that, and that's Peter's main point. And if you want to know the purpose of the passage, you want to know the goal of this passage, what God wants to accomplish in this passage, and what the goal of this sermon is, all you have to do is look at the very first word. Praise, or blessed. Literally, it's blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To bless God, when we bless God, that means to recognize his worthiness to be praised. It's an emotional exclamation calling upon everyone around to acknowledge and rejoice in some wonderful aspect of what God is like and to give honor and glory and praise to him because of that attribute. That's what it means when we say, bless the Lord. Peter begins his letter with an emotional outburst. And that's significant. He didn't have to do that. He could have just stated the facts, like people usually do when they talk about regeneration and new birth. Just a lecture. Just state the facts. That's what Peter does throughout the rest of his letter. He just, he just states the facts. Right? Not a lot of emotion. But instead of that, he puts, at the beginning here, he puts the emotion of his heart on paper in the very first word because that emotional response to the new birth is the point. That's the whole point that he's making. His main point is not that we've been born again. It's not that we have a living hope. It's not even the God of mercy. It's not that we have this eternal secure inheritance. It's not even the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. His main point in his opening sentence is an exclamation of his heart, bless God for all that. That's the point. Worship. And this is yet another example of the principle that we learned in our study of worship. The purpose of of theology is doxology, right? Theology is, doxology is worship, theology is doctrine. Purpose of doctrine is worship. And all true doctrine leads to worship. And all true worship is a response to doctrine. So, how do we respond to this? How do you respond to a passage like this? Uh, what's our application? How do we put it into practice? What are the implications for the way that we live this week? Well, one obvious one is we should live lives of hope, right? We're responsible to do that because it brings God glory. We must do it. When people live in a good mood for no other reason than future goodness from God, and that's it, that honors God, that glorifies God, and therefore it must be done. We must do it. But the most important way to respond to this passage is to do what? Praise, right? That's the one direct call to action in the passage. Praise, praise. Bless God for all this. Just bless him. Keep thinking about these things. Keep thinking about them until joy boils up in your heart and forces praise out of your mouth. Who's ever heard of a religion? I mean, besides Christianity, have you ever heard of any religion where the main requirement imposed on the people by their God, is that they tap into transcendent joy and live in hope. Just, I mean, it's just amazing what God requires. All we have to do, all he asks of us, is to live lives of hope. Just live in hope in him. He tells us, live in hope. We say, but God, how do I do that? And he says, here, here, let me help. And he gives us an inheritance beyond anything we can ever imagine. Ridiculous, out of proportion, huge inheritance and he unleashes his mercy on us, and he gives us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection and all this amazing inheritance, and, and, and he makes it absolutely certain by raising Jesus Christ from the dead, and then he just calls us to en enjoy it. And he gets all the glory, and we get all the joy. And we say with the psalmist, I will praise you forever for what you have done. In your name, I will hope, for in your name, uh, for your name is good, I will praise you in the presence of the saints.